The victims of serial killers go through all manners of unimaginable pains while their assailants take away the precious gifts of life from them. However, there is no way we can adequately capture the pain of older people that became the targets of some serial killers. The victims of this particular killer will have you appalled. In 1989, shock spread across Australia as older women were killed by the battering of their head and their bodies positioned in a lewd manner. Welcome or welcome back to Twisted Minds. My name is James, and today we'll dive into the mind and life events of John Wayne Glover, Australia's granny killer. John Wayne Glover was born on November 26, 1932. He hailed from England before emigrating to Australia in 1956, where he spent the rest of his life. John's issues with older women started with his mother, Freda. She was promiscuous, had four husbands, and multiple boyfriends. Glover was convicted of numerous petty offenses while growing up, including stealing clothing and purses, dating back to 1947. When he was 14 years old, he dropped out of school and joined the British Army. He was dismissed from the British service when his earlier offenses were found. This was the reasoning behind his emigration to Australia, where he first stayed in Melbourne in 1956 or 1957s with no qualifications. Glover later became a naturalized Australian citizen shortly after he arrived in Australia. His promiscuous mother would have negatively impacted John's early life and adult life. The message she was passing across to him was, women are sexual objects. Or, on the other hand, there was no security in partnership. John's mother moved from one man to the next since no one was good enough for her. John too would have felt he was not good enough for her, which is why she focused all of her attention on her promiscuous behavior. There is no evidence that Glover killed anyone before 1989 when he was 56 years old. He had been married for 20 years and had two children at this point, and his wife was unaware of his earlier offenses. John Wayne Glover was the last person you'd expect to be suspected of being a serial killer after his rather uneventful adulthood. He was as quiet as he was sinister. He was from middle class society, a big, friendly man in his late 50s who you could leave in the care of your kids or ask to keep an eye on your house while you were away. Glover was a volunteer charity worker with the Senior Citizen Society. Listed among his friends was a former mayor of Mosman, with whom he would often have a drink with at his favorite watering hole, the Mosman Returned Serviceman's Leagues Club, which only adds to the pretense of a normal life. Glover's true charity, though, was for himself. He would gamble and drink away the earnings of his muggings and killings. Glover got a job as a sales representative for the 4 and 20 Pie Company to further his image as an ordinary middle aged man. His warm handshake and cheery smile instantly endeared him to new acquaintances. However, lurking beneath that cheerful appearance was one of Australia's most twisted serial killers, a savage murderer that preyed on weak older women. Glover was found guilty of robbery on two counts in Victoria and one count of theft in New South Wales shortly after his arrival. He was also found guilty in Melbourne in 1962 of two counts of assaulting ladies, two counts of indecent assault, one case of assault occasioning serious bodily harm, and four counts of robbery. The Melbourne victims were viciously and repeatedly battered in the head and body on each occasion. They were shoved to the floor as the attacker furiously pulled off their clothes, but their their shouts alerted neighbors, who called the cops and came to their help. The savagery of the attacks astounded those who arrived early. The second victim, a 24-year-old lady who was walking home from a meeting at 10.30 p.m., was discovered in the front yard of a house. She was dazed and shocked when she reported to the police that the man had followed her down a dark residential street and tracked her down as she tried to flee. He knocked her unconscious, causing her to scream. She awoke on the lawn, bleeding profusely, and with her underwear in disarray. When her shouts awoke the neighborhood, the perpetrator had fled. Residents reported seeing a young man rushing into a nearby yard, prompting the arrest of 29-year-old Glover, who was working as a television rigger for the Australian Broadcasting Commission and residing in the leafy Melbourne suburb of Camberwell at the time. 
Glover claimed he was emotionally drained after a fight with his girlfriend. He was apprehended and detained for the night before being released on bail the next morning. Glover was stopped as he was leaving the police station by two other investigators who had heard about his arrest. They wanted to talk to him about a similar assault that happened a few weeks ago. Glover initially denied any knowledge of the incident, but after further investigation, he admitted to the earlier assault and was returned to the station to be recharged. Glover's previous convictions and the savagery of the attacks astounded the detectives, who let him off with a good behavior bond and three years probation. Over 20 years later, on January 11th, 1989, Glover noticed 84-year-old Margaret Todd Hunter walking down peaceful Hale Road in Mosman, and that was the start of it all, as he would later describe it. He parked his car, and once he was sure no one was looking, he punched the unsuspecting victim in the face with a swinging right hook, robbing her of her $209 handbag. You horrible bugger, Mrs. Todd Hunter yelled as he ran down the street with her luggage. Glover took the stolen money to the Mosman RSL, where he drank and played poker machines. The investigating officers ruled the event mugging, who believed that someone noticed the older woman with the money and waited for the opportune opportunity to strike. Muggings are common in Sydney's drug infested area. While the case was thoroughly investigated, there was little possibility of retrieving the money or apprehending the perpetrator of such a terrible act. Mrs. Todd Hunter unscathed it through the event although she was seriously bruised and shaken. She was also extraordinarily fortunate, as it turned out, considering how Glover's next victims would end up. It was not long before Glover's robberies turned into murders. His next victim was not so lucky. He had a few drinks at the Mosman RSL after work on March 1st, 1989, and was driving down a busy military road in the mid-afternoon when he observed Gwendoline Mitchell Hill strolling home from the shops with her walking stick. She was 82 years old. Glover rushed back to his car, where he tucked a hammer under his belt. Then he came out stealthily and followed the older woman into her front foyer of her retirement home. He slammed the hammer against the back of her head as she turned the key in the lock. He smashed her in the head and body many times with such force that he shattered many ribs in her frail jockey frame. He ran away with her wallet, which contained $100. Mrs. Mitchell Hill was miraculously still alive when two schoolboys discovered her, but she became the granny killer's first official murder victim just minutes after the police and paramedics arrived. As Mrs. Mitchell Hill breathed her last, Glover sat in his living room, wondering aloud to his wife what the distant sirens meant. The police were perplexed once more. However, there was no evidence linking the two instances. There was a possibility that they were all created by the same person, but it was a long shot. The authorities had no eyewitnesses or leads, and there was no clear evidence linking this incident to Margaret Todd Hunter's earlier attack. Well-intentioned neighbors had cleaned the crime scene, believing she had simply fallen. Police eventually concluded that it was yet another mugging gone wrong. John Glover would later have to kill four more older women and assault a host of others before being brought to book. His second victim came 10 weeks later. Glover was walking to the Mosman RSL Club in Military Road in the late afternoon of May 9th when he spotted Lady Winifred Ashton. She was the widow of English-Australian painter Sir Will Ashton. Dressed in a red raincoat and using a walking stick, approaching him slowly. Lady Ashton had just finished playing bingo at the RSL and was on her way home to Raglan Street. Glover put on gloves and followed her into her apartment building's foyer, where he assaulted her with his hammer and tossed her to the ground in the trash bin. Despite having limp cancer, the little and fragile Lady Ashton fought bravely as Glover later admitted. At one point, she almost had me until I fell on top of her and repeatedly banged her head against the concrete. Lady Winifred Ashton died at the age of 84. John Glover removed Lady Ashton's pantyhose and strangled her with them while she was unconscious. Although no sexual act occurred, Glover's brutal ritual would become his calling card. Glover then placed her walking stick and shoes at her feet, as though paying respect to the deceased woman before departing with her purse, which contained $100. Glover Glover later told the bartenders at the Mosman RSL that he hoped the sirens they heard coming around the corner weren't for another mugging. As he carefully
carefully fed the contents of Lady Ashton's purse into the poker machines, police didn't believe they had a serial killer on their hands until now. There were far too many similarities. To date, all victims were affluent older women who lived in the same neighborhood, were beaten or killed in similar ways, and had their handbags stolen. In the course of his rounds as a pie salesman, Glover began abusing older women confined to their beds in nursing homes. Glover first molested 77-year-old Mrs. Marjorie Mosley on June 6, 1989 at the Wesley Gardens Retirement Home in Belrose, which is quite a distance from Mosman, while on his nursing home rounds, claiming that the guy had placed his hand under her undergown. She couldn't recollect his appearance. Glover then paid a visit to the Caroline Chisholm Nursing Home in nearby Lane Cove on June 24th. He took a slow walk upstairs, raising an older woman's clothing and fondling her buttock. He put his hand down the front of another woman's nightdress and caressed her breasts as he moved to the room next door. Glover was briefly questioned by authorities, but not detained as he made a hastily getaway after the terrified woman screamed. Local police investigated the incidences, but they were unrelated to the Mosman murders. It took a long time for this information to be considered useful to the Granny Killer Task Force. Glover assaulted old Effie Carney on a quiet street in Linfield, not far from Mosman, on August 8th, 1989, and took her goods. On October 6th, he pretended to be a doctor. He ran his hand up the dress of Phyllis McNeil, a patient at the Wimbia Nursing Home in neutral bay. When the blind older woman cried up for aid, he avoided capture once more. Glover appeared to be able to walk into and out of hospitals at will. The pastry salesman was never suspected. Throughout the entire sequence of molestations, he was never identified. The breakthrough to capture him came when a nurse discovered him in a hospital ward after an older woman he had assaulted pressed the alarm button on her bed. Police could not question him because he fled the scene and attempted suicide at home. He was transferred to the hospital where he got better. Glover came under police surveillance after that. He was apprehended when he murdered Joan Sinclair in her house. He also attempted suicide after horribly killing her. Sinclair was 60 years old and she and Glover had started a platonic relationship. He came to her house at 10 a.m. Glover was nowhere to be found by 1 p.m., nor was there any indication of light from the residence. The police began to grow concerned about the situation. Everything was still quiet at 5 p.m., so they received Hagen's permission to go in at 6 p.m., realizing that something wasn't right. They discovered a hammer in a pool of drying blood on the mat. They observed a pair of woman's panties and a man's shirt covered in blood when they peered further around the doorway. Then, a woman's figure appeared. A bundle of blood-soaked towels was tied around Joan Sinclair's wounded head. She wore pantyhose around her neck and was completely naked from the waist down. Glover would later deny sexually meddling with her genitals, even though her genitals had been damaged. There was an unconscious, naked, overweight, gray-haired man in the tub. One wrist had been sliced, and there was a strong odor of alcohol in the air. The relieved investigators hoped he was still alive and well. Their prayers had been answered. John Wayne Glover, the granny killer, was the man in the bath. Glover told investigators about the final chapter in the granny killer murders after he recovered in the hospital. <laughs> The response Glover gave to the question, why, was, I don't know. I've only seen these ladies, but they seem to have triggered something in me. All I have to do now is be violent toward them. His wife, Gail, and their two kids, both in their late teens, were taken aback when he was charged with murdering six old women. There had never been a hint that the man they adored as a husband and parent was the granny killer. John Wayne Glover pleaded not guilty to six counts of murder on the grounds of diminished responsibility at his trial in November 1991. In in other words, Glover claimed that he was briefly insane when he committed the murder. Glover was condemned to the six life sentences by Justice Wood. He was detained at Lithgow Prison, where he was housed in a high security cell. Glover was placed on suicide watch in May 2005 after collapsing in his cell and telling prison staff, I've had enough, I want to kill myself. A mental health review team evaluated him and closed circuit television was used to keep an eye on him. He was also subjected to medical exams as a result of the two cancer procedures he had endured the previous year. Glover was found dead in his Lithgow maximum security prison cell on September 10, 2005 and pronounced dead at 1.25 p.m. The 72-year-old serial killer hung himself, according to reports. These do not ease the pain of the families of the victims. However, they can take solace in knowing that the granny killer was brought to justice. 
Thanks for watching. That was the case of John Wayne Glover. And why don't you go ahead and click on one of the two videos on your screen for another one of our videos.